All right, welcome to CS4510. Uh, the title of today is uh, 11B on uh, Russell's Paradox. So we left off last time talking about foundations of mathematics, about some philosophical problems with the nature of truth, and that you know mathematics itself needed to be provided on a more rigorous foundation because who's to say that there was no, what if there's an alternative model, there's alternative models of geometry, who's to say there may not be alternative models of arithmetic, calculus, who knows, right? So we need to create a very strong formal system of everything. Um, and the axiomatic method is what was pursued in originally because it has, uh, a lot of strong history. It starts, of course, with Aristotle's metaphysics. We mentioned about Euclid's geometry, but it also starts uh, with the organon. We won't mention this uh, anymore except for the fact that it exists. Again, the ancient Greeks didn't do things that were perhaps too impressive. They were just the first to do it. Leibniz has the guy who invented calculus, right, and also those cookies. Leibniz, uh, in fact, he has the better calculus. He has this quote. Um, uh, he was kind of obsessed later, later in his life with building the first mechanical calculators. Like, you have a bunch of gears and pipes and wires, and somehow it can, it, it can add or it can carry a bit. If you think about it, when you add numbers together, it is, of course, a mechanical procedure. It's, an opera, it's a sequence of steps that is done without any creative input from the user. It's just sort of carried out. And he, he was concerned with building some mechanical calculators this way. I don't know if he really got to them. But he also, he also realized that thought is perhaps performed according to the laws Similar laws as that as arithmetic. So he says, it is obvious if we could find characters or signs suited for expressing all our thoughts as clearly and exactly as arithmetic expresses numbers or geometry expresses lines. We, could do in also, we can do in all matters insofar as they are subject to reasoning that all we can do in arithmetic or geometry. For all investigations which depend upon reasoning would be carried about by transposing these characters by species of calculus. So by calculus here he means a symbolic manipulation, a manipulation of symbols. If... If we couldn't formalize thought, then we can, uh, of course, think in the formal language and then produce new thoughts that way, quote unquote, without having to actually do the thinking ourselves, just as pure uh, manipulation. Uh, there's another guy named Piano. He came up with something called Formulario for Mathematico. And basically, he came up with perhaps mathematics is, of course, a creative art. It's uh, dramatic. Um, but there was these attempts, of course, to create a mechanical version of it. Formula Mathematica was this. And he had hoped that uh, calculus teachers all over Italy would adopt his system. And, and he says, you know, there's no need to do theorems. There's no need to prove things anymore. Simply write the axioms down and state the way you may proceed from the axioms to provide a proof. It's a very uneducated unedu 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 way of thinking. And in fact, he was almost fired for trying to teach calculus this way. This is no way we do, this is not the way we intuitively do mathematics. I mean, like today, the standard set of axioms we do is called ZFC. I think proving 1 plus 1 equals 2 takes 18,000 steps in ZFC, in pure uh, manipulation. But this was sort of a primitive idea. He didn't really know. Uh, probably the greatest contribution to this was a guy named Frege. Frege? He wrote this thing. I'm not going to be able to pronounce this or say this correctly. Be Griff, shrift, big Griff shift, and it was a set of axioms, uh, essentially that carried out in a more modern setting what Aristotle and Euclid had started. So we mentioned the law of excluded middle. This is of course due to uh, Aristotle, but it's um, of course it's prior to him as well. But the way we formalize this today is in the propositional logic notation. Right. This to be true. Fridge defined very closely to what we define as propositional calculus today. P implies Q, existentially quantification, universal quantification, ands and ors and nots, De Morgan's law even. Very, very basic stuff. And to perform this, he does, like any scientific theory, you go to, you take some samples, you create a hypothesis, you just explore if that works or not. So he explored the way thinking works. Uh, we already mentioned why we believe excluded middle to be true. We mentioned truth is uh, too valued. Um, 
Same thing with uh, modus ponens and so on. So a lot of the axioms that we use today are in fact taken from him. And it's sort of a, a primitive system. I'll lift some of them for you. Uh, a implies not not A. And again, actually, it's interestingly, I don't have that down as a bijection. Uh, C equals D implies F of C equals F of D. Certainly true. I mean, you may have used that without even realizing it's an axiom, but it is. Um, and of course, A implies B. And A implies what? B. Modus ponens again. Right? We can credit that to him. Hypothetical syllogism. Um, so the bigger shift was, I'll just call it Frege's system. Frege's system was uh, a kind of what we would call a naive set theory. So set theory was, is a relatively new uh, thing. The idea was you define objects, and those objects need to have uh, types. We, today we write x is an element of s, and this is read as x is an element of s, to mean that s is some sort of collection of things, and that x is there. You know? that the, the idea of set theory is one of containment. But this is kind of a relatively new interpretation of set theory. Set theory, in fact, was uh, closer in its time to a declaration. This E is supposed to mean, in Greek, aota. Again, I don't know how to pronounce that. But this is, does not mean in as in con contained within, like you can stack Tupperware. It means is. So this is, in fact, not x and s is not meant to mean x is an element of the set of s but rather, S is declared to be uh, a type of something, and that this is, in fact, a type declaration, the way a programming language works. So for example, if S is the set of all triangles, and you say X is an element of S, that implies that X is a triangle. That's the way set theory was done naively. This is sort of the early. Uh, ideas that we had. Um, bigger, uh, Frege and others wanted to pursue something uh, that was called, today we call this Hilbert's program. Hold on. I've got to have, I brought seven markers today. Today we call this Hilbert's program. Uh, there are four main goals of Hilbert's program. Hilbert's program was a mathematical uh, initiative by David Hilbert, uh, the, the king of logicism, excuse me, formalism. Um, Hilbert looked at, early on in his mathematical career, he looked at Euclidean geometry, and he spent a lot of time on the foundations of axiomatic Euclidean geometry. He rewrote the axioms and rewrote them and rewrote them, and today the axioms of Euclidean geometry used are basically his axioms. Right? So he went, satisfied with that, he went on to trying to do foundation of all of mathematics. And he has the following uh, few points. Let's see if I can find them. So the first one is formal language, is that all mathematics ought to be written in a precise formal language. Language, as we speak it today, we understand has much ambiguity. So first we're going to invent a new language which removes this ambiguity. For example, I don't know. X equal Y and Y equal X. Y equals Z implies X equals Z, something, right? Those are symbols that do not exist in English, yet uh, the idea of when I say X is equal to Y and Y is equal to Z implies X is equal to Z, this is the sentence of the symbols is unambiguous, while the English sentence perhaps may be ambiguous. What if I pause my intonation? Something like this, right? Uh, kind of a relatively new concept. The idea of balancing equations even is a relatively new concept. Arithmetic is manipulation of symbols. So all ideas ought to be expressed in a formal language, first off. And what are called well-formed formulas. Right? Quantification and so on. This can obviously be done for the declarative parts of English. Uh, well, most of the declarative parts of English into propositional calculus, right? Um, two was completeness. 
Completeness is that uh, the property of being true within a mathematical system has to correspond perfectly, exactly, and only to the concept of being provable. Um, if T is true, then there is a proof of it. Truth may only be asserted by direct implication, combination, applying the laws of thought from the axioms. This is not some strict intuitionistic requirement, but simply that that which is true has to, if something is true, it must be provably so. Nothing exists which is true and has no proof to represent its truth. Everything that is true must be provably so. Truth comes from proof and nowhere else. This is what he asserts. Uh, three, consistency. For any set of axiomatic systems, let's say we're trying to prove axiomatic systems, that uh, the axiomatic system ought not to prove uh, 0 equals 1, right? They're searching for a good foundation of mathematics, some set of axioms to satisfy this, perhaps it's Frege's system or whatever. But we hope to create a system that is complete, everything that is true, that can be expressed as formal language within the system, is also provable from the system. And also, the system is not capable of proving 0 equals 1. Again, 0 equals 1 consistency is a much more important requirement, in fact, than completeness, because if a system is inconsistent, it's not even usable. Uh, if some system is 0 equals 1, then every statement can be proved true and false simultaneously. Right? So um, completeness and consistency. And then four is decidability. Um, if a statement can be proved, if a statement is true, the proof can be found by purely mechanical means. Uh, there exists a procedure, a process, to determine what the proof is of a statement, if it is true. Right? Or the negation of a statement, if it's false. So it, in some sense, mathematics is, create, is supposed to be creative. You apply um, theorems. You combine things. You come out. You spit out an answer. There's a bit of elegance in, in, in that regard. Decidability asserts that this process can be mechanized. That there is, today, we would say there exists an algorithm for this, right? even though this is pre-scientific. This is before the definition of an algorithm was given by Alan Turing. Right? Questions on Hilbert's program so far? So let me give you uh, an example set of axioms. And we'll talk about another example set of axioms. I have Piano's axioms for number three somewhere. So Piano attempts to create a formal set of axioms for uh, the nat natural numbers, the way we use and interact with natural numbers. And he comes up with the following few. Um, and again, an axiom ought to be so simple that it cannot be disagreed with, and this, uh, that there is no way that one could be derived from the other. Right? So here's the first axiom. Uh, zero exists. Controversial. True. But certainly you believe that. Um, equality is reflexive. Uh, excuse me. Equality is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So for all x, x is equal to x. Uh, for all x, for all y. Uh, x is equal to y, if and only if y is equal to x. And then finally, transitivity for all x, for all y, for all z. Uh, x equals y, and uh, y equals z uh, implies x equals z. Right? And again, without this as an axiom, you can't assume that. You cannot assume x equals x. Ironically, but it's such a so, it's so primitive that it must be assumed. Uh, for all x, for all x, for all y, uh, x is a natural implies. Excuse me, x is a natural, and x is equal to y implies that y is a natural. Now, what does this axiom assert? What is this axiom actually saying? Take a second to think about it. Almost too obvious to ask, yeah. You mean like x is some type and y is the same as x and y is also that type? Yes. Basically, uh, I'll use, the, I'll use the, uh, the same phrasing. I mean, I'll, I'll use a different phrasing for the same thing. The naturals are closed under equality. So 
That's, that's what that axiom asserts. Um, for all uh, n, n is a natural number, implies that s of n is a natural number, where s of n is our successor function. This is, of course, the induction. Every ma 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 mathematician's most powerful tool is induction. Everything, is in everything about infinite is, of course, induction. Successor function, of course, we defined as uh, n plus 1 if you're using arithmetic here. Um, Here's one. For all n, for all m, uh, s of n is equal to s of m implies that n equals m. So basically, the succession for all numbers goes in the same direction, so to speak. If you don't have that axiom, they could go infinitely in two different ways. Um, and there's one final axiom, which is that no number exists, is, which is the successor of uh, 0. So these are like kind of the, he like just kind of made them up, and then we found out actually these are pretty good. We call these pianos axioms. Some time was spent trying to prove that pianos axioms were uh, consistent because they're so basic and elementary. Today we would write uh, the consistency of pianos axioms to be the statement expressed in a well-formed formula to represent the consistency of pianos axioms. So in some sense, if you were trying to use a number theoretic proof of pianos axioms to prove the consistency of Piano's axioms, what you're re really trying to prove is that the piano, uh, Piano's axioms prove the consistency of Piano's axioms. And there was some difficulty that ran into this kind of, this kind of uh, uh, logic. So it might thought maybe, OK, numbers are cool. What else do we need? Maybe we can't do this. We, we still don't know today, I think, if Piano's axioms are consistent or not. But assuming con the consistency is not controversial. Sometimes the proof will be like conditional on the assumption that Piano's axioms are consistent. right? I thought that it was like, we provably cannot prove its own consistency within the system. Or I guess I can't, you mean like, can we go to an external system and then like... Yes, yes. Transfinite induction, things like this. Yeah. Piano's axioms, not everything is a number, importantly. So it turns out that uh, the number guys were almost right, but the set guys were way more right. Because you can define, uh, given a set, given axioms for numbers, you cannot define sets. But given axioms for set theory, a na naive set theory, you can define uh, axioms for numbers. Let me see if I can give you um, some axioms of a naive set theory. We have an ex axiom called existentiality. Ex cool part about being a logician and a mathematician in general is you get to use words that sound like spell books. Existentiality. Uh, I'm going to write this axiom. You tell me what this says. Um, for all x, uh, for all y. Uh, for all z, uh, z is an element of x, uh, if and only if uh, z is an element of y, uh, implies that x is equal to y. What is the axiom of existentiality asserting? Why do we need it? What's important for it? Two sets are equal only if they contain the same elements. The definition of equality of sets. The definition of numbers is simple. They're the same. They, they're the same number. What is the definition of existentiality? The definition of existentiality is that, excuse me, what is the definition of a quality of sets? Two sets are equal if and only if they contain the same elements. Those elements may themselves be sets, and those two sets are equal if they contain the same elements, and so on. This is something you should know, right? But this is the axiom for it. It's called existentiality. Is this supposed to be a biconditional? Not as given. Really? Yes, it's the definition, although it is certainly true. I'm gonna. I have my notes as an implication, and I've said an implication like that for like over a year. And I've always thought that, it, of course, it should be a biconditional because it's a definition. I don't remember why I write, wrote it as an if and only if. Only 85% certain, as given in naive set theory, is it a one-way implication? Okay. Sometimes people do things like this, and I don't know if they did it that way on purpose because it's a weaker assumption, and they're like, we don't actually need it as a biconditional. Let's not have it as a biconditional, yeah. or if it's a personal typo. I actually don't know. 85% is not a typo. Okay. Um, Here's one called unrestricted comprehension. Um, there exists a set y such that for all x, that uh, x is an element of y uh, if and only if a well-formed formula, a predicate 5x, is true.
what is the what is this axiom saying? You can like construct a predicate that classifies things into being true and false, and you can construct a set that contains all the things such that the like function is true. It, if there there exists a set of elements that satisfy a predicate. Consider the following predicate, and this is an interesting one over the well-formed formulas. Man, hold on. There we go. Okay. Consider the following predicate, and consider our universe of discourse is the natural numbers, not sets. Uh, define this to be there does not exist z such that uh, z is less than or equal to x, uh, and it is not true that z is equal to one, and uh, it is not true that z is equal to x, and uh, z is a divisor of x. Also, x is greater than or equal to 1, greater than 1. This is a predicate over the well-formed formulas where the divisor symbol is perhaps defined as multiplication, right? Uh, a divides b is equivalent to there exists c such that a c is equal to b, right? So in a nested way, what numbers satisfy this predicate? Prime numbers. Prime numbers. This is a predicate for the prime numbers. So therefore, we may use the axiom of unrestricted comprehension with such a predicate, and we may construct a set of all primes. Axiom of unrestricted comprehension, well-formed pr predicate, there exists a set of all prime numbers. Questions on that one? We got it? So. Uh, existentiality, unrestricted comprehension, two pretty useful, perhaps even trivial terms. Unrestricted comprehension is not so controversial at all. This is basically the set builder notation we use, right? If you have, when you, you do, use set builder notation, you say x is an element of some universe of discourse, natural, strings, whatever we're talking about, so that's subject to some conditions, and those conditions are themselves just the predicate, right? So unrestricted comprehension is just the set builder notation that we use today. It's the same stuff. Let's talk about a way to construct natural numbers from set theory. Given set theory, we'll prove you can do natural number stuff, but not necessarily true given natural numbers can use set theory. So what we're going to do is construct a set of ordinals. An ordinal is a set that pretends it's a number. Um, but it's not a number. It's just a set we pretend it's a number. When you have a set, a set is a collection of objects, right? But if you define those objects within a set of axioms, you have to say what they are. So what we do is that a, we define the set of axioms to exist in such a way that the sets, the elements of the sets, are themselves only other sets. So sets may only contain each other. There's a, there's a sequence of Tupperware containments such that they only contain other Tupperwares. And nothing is ended up in the food at all. Right? So for example, uh, why by unrestricted comprehension does the empty set exist? Yeah, predicate that uh, ha that uh, is always false. Choose a predicate to be choose the predicate to be um, some contradiction. No, nothing satisfies such a contradiction. So there exists a set with no elements in it, and that set is therefore the empty set. So the empty set exists not axiomatically, but constructed through the axiom of unrestricted comprehension. Uh, we'll define the number zero to be the empty set. Okay, then uh, for w a number or an ordinal here, define uh, the successor of w to be the set w union, the set containing w. So instead of n is n plus 1, successor of n is n plus 1, we're going to define the successor to be the following way. 1 is going to be defined to be this, the empty set union, the set containing the empty set, which is just going to be the set containing the empty set. Okay. Uh, 2 is going to be the set containing the empty set unioned with the set containing the set containing the empty set. So that, that is a set that is going to contain the empty set and the set containing the empty set. This is some discrete math exercise. Let's see if we can do three. Well, the empty set is in there, and it's going to be the set containing the empty set. And then it's going to contain the set containing the empty set and the set containing the empty set. OK, easy, easy peasy. Let's do one more, four. OK. This is going to be the set containing the empty set, the set containing the empty set, and then the set containing the set containing, excuse me, the set containing 
the empty set and the set containing the empty set, as well as the set which contains the empty set, the set containing the empty set, the set containing the empty set, and the set containing the empty set, as its elements, yes. That's probably right, okay. Anyway, verbose, long, confusing, yet none of the symbols used here are numbers. These are, this is a, this is a set. It has how many elements? Four. This has only four elements in it. The four elements are themselves the ordinals that are previous. One is a set containing zero. Two is, in some sense, a set containing one, uh, zero and one, right? So you can define equality of these ordinals and, uh, and the ordering of the ordinals as a relationship among sets. So using set theory, you can define axioms. Let's do uh, two things. Let's prove 1 is equal to 1. So 1 is equal to 1. We have, by the axiom of existentiality, we know that two sets are equal if they have the same elements. So we want to, we want to conclude that z is an element of the set containing the empty set, uh, if and only if. Uh, z is an element of the set containing the empty set. So z is equal to the empty set, and therefore, uh, and then z is then an element of the set containing the empty set. OK, good. What about if z is the empty set? Then that implies z is an element of the set containing the empty set. OK, QED, so 1 equals 1, right? Something like this. Verbose, ugly, but you can found number theory on top of mathematics. The two relations that we care most about numbers are equality, and uh, uh, the ordering of this, the, the less than, right? So let um, numbers i is equal to j if and, if, if and only if, and we'll call it O of i is equal to O of j. This is how you define equality of numbers is to be equality of the ordinals representing those numbers. That is an equality of sets using the axiom of existentiality, and we define then the ax the equality of numbers to be equal if the ordinals representing those numbers is equivalent, right? Uh, here's another one. Uh, I is strictly less than j if and only if what? Give me a set theoretic operation which is true if and only if I is less than j. O of I is a subset. Subset? Consider a subset. Uh, we want an if and only if. I is an element. Yes. We can use the element of operation to construct a set of numbers, right? Notice how 3 is really a set of uh, 0, 1, 2, right? Importantly, this construct, there's other constructions of the naturals. This is called the von Neumann construction. A cool part about it is you get the operations really trivially. You also get uh, that that the that the ordinal for four is a set of four elements, right? All right. So uh, Bertrand Russell comes along, and he has uh, an interesting question. Uh, what should we do, before we proceed further into set uh, logic, any questions so far? Anyone lost? OK. Um, Bertrand Russell proposed an interesting idea, which is what should we consider if we suppose we were working on a naive set theory, such as Fredges, and specifically Fredges, and suppose we have both the axiom of existentiality and we have the axiom of uh, unrestricted comprehension. Consider the predicate to define sets as those which do not contain themselves. This is the well-formed formula over logical symbols. This certainly is a well-formed formula. So by the axiomatic system, we may apply the well-formed formula to the axiom of unrestricted comprehension, and we may construct a set of all sets which do not contain themselves. So if we apply this mechanically, we're going to get, um, uh, I'm just simply going to apply you know, the formalist method. I'm going to take the axiom, substring replace out the predicate. We're going to get, there exists y for all x. x is an element of y, if and only if. 
x is not an element of x. Agree? I simply took the axiom. I replaced phi with my own predicate phi. By the axiom of unrestricted comprehension, we've constructed a set, those which do not contain themselves. Um, uh, now we perform specification uh, since it's true uh, for all x. It's true for x is equal to y. If it's true for every x, it's also true for the case when x is equal to y. And again, those are overall possible sets. Um, consider the sets. Consider the case when x is equal to y. Right. So we simply will. If x is equal to y, we may call them the same thing. We'll replace every instance of x with an instance of y. We get that y is an element of y if and only if y is not an element of y. Right? Contradiction is what I would say if we were working within a proof by contradiction. But we're not. I didn't begin the, the premise with saying, assume to the contrary something radical, and then I derive an absurdity. I simply started with basic premises, simply the two axioms of naive set theory, and I proved that they're inconsistent. This is true if and only if this is false. That's insane. This is what's called Russell's paradox. Russell's paradox essentially says, in a more general sense, any naive set theory with, an unrestricted, with a principle of unrestricted comprehension is itself inconsistent. So Fred is this guy. He comes around. He spends a lot of his time on building the system, bigger shrift. And in a letter before it's to be published, Russell sends him this. And it's like, wow, uh, your whole thing is inconsistent. If, you can, if something is true and false simultaneously, of course, there exists a proof that everything is true and everything is also false. So there, the concept of truth is not modeled here in his system. Given unrestricted comprehension, you cannot derive truth. Two quick remarks. First off, this is the sets. We took a well-formed formula independent of meaning, and we showed that something is true if and only if it is false. But we may, again, go back and assign meaning to what that means. Consider the sets that do not contain themselves. Today, this is controversial. You do not consider a set able to contain itself. But back then, this was allowed. The set of all ideas itself was an idea and ought to contain itself. The set of all birds was not a bird and ought not to contain itself. Right? There's a distinction to be made between those two. Um, but first comment is, what is the name of this proof technique? Self-reference. Self-reference. I'll call it diagonalization. This is the same diagonalization technique that uh, Cantor used to show that the cardinality of a set was uncountable. Where does the diagonalization occur here? We took a negated self-reference, right? the same way we constructed a set to contain elements if and only if certain sets did not contain those elements. We simply here uh, defined a, the sets which do not contain themselves. That is our self-reference. A diagonalization proof always has a few uh, characteristic marks about it. It's usually self-referential in nature. It says something about itself, yet it is not circular. It's simply self-referential. There is some negation somewhere going on. So here, this is our diagonal, so to speak. Right? The part where we take the diagonal of the table occurs when we perform specification. For all x, this, consider x and y range over a two-dimensional table. The case when x is equal to y is there the di then the diagonal of the table. right? If you say x1, x2, x3, y1, y2, y3, the case when x is equal to y is the diagonal. right? So construction of this, you look at one special value of it, you observe your contradiction. This is a proof by diagonalization. E yes? Can you fix this axiomatic system by like, not allowing predicates in the form like x is an element of x? We'll talk about that. There's 20, there's 20 years of history behind that one. We'll get, we'll get to that before the end of today. Um, it's good that you're already thinking about how to fix this, though. Um, right. So if you take natural language and you formalize this, the way this, this is what's an equivalence of what's called the liar's paradox. Uh, this sentence is false. Again, it is a declarative sentence, yet it is self-referential. So how should it be formalized? How can you cast this into the language of the propositional calculus? Um, Lyer's paradox it has existed, again, also for millennia. And only when we come to the formalization do we observe an issue with it. There's only a, that's only when the bad things happen. Um, uh, here's another one. 
all Cretans are liars. And this was said by Epidemes, I think. Epidemes of Crete. Right? So accretion, he said that. The reason this is a paradox is because if the sentence is true, then we may deduce from the truth of the sentence that the sentence is false, contradicting the fact that we assume the sentence is true. So if the sentence is false, then the negation of the sentence must therefore be true. So if the sen then the sentence, the sentence is not false, means the sentence is true. This is contradicting the assumption that we made that the sentence is false. Right? This is not a sentence that is, can be assigned to truth value naturally through a naive system like this. I'll give you one more example of uh, the liar's paradox. And this is from uh, Don Quixote. A traveler has fallen among cannibals. They offer him the opportunity to assert a sentence. If it is true, he is boiled. If it is false, he is roasted. If it's true, he is boiled. If it is false, he is roasted. What should he say? I will be roasted. I will be roasted. So again, the liar's paradox has existed for a long time. Only now do we see in the formalization that it has occurred an issue. Yeah. Would you accept this and then like kind of side with the intuitionists that say like the law of excluded middle is not true because of sentences like this? Or is it kind of different? The intuitionists would take this as evidence that formalization of mathematics cannot be done. So they use this as evidence, but perhaps not total proof that uh, certain groups of people are their philosophy is flawed. Absolutely. We'll talk about that as well. Do they just believe that mathematics can't really be formalized at all and it's all just intuition? It has to be used only the notions that come before your very eyes. Like, you make a, a step in a proof, they make a step in a... If you make a step in a proof... So, like, intuitively, we do proof today as a game. The writer makes a small jump, the reader believes it. The writer makes a small jump, the reader believes it. Then at the, the end of the game, the reader is forced to accept exactly and only the truth the writer wanted them to. They draw the conclusion themselves. But at each step, it is done through the intuition. It's not done delegation with respect to the set of axioms. And they want to leave it in this formal, informal pre-scientific concept. Yeah. So obviously, we have an issue here. Uh, how should we fix this? Let's talk about how to fix this. There's two ways to fix this uh, immediately that come to mind. One is simply better than the other, right? Russell finds this. He's like uh, himself. He's a, a logicist, so he's not like uh, throwing out the axiomatic method, but he's simply concerned with the way to fix this. So what does he do? He uh, there's two historical proposals for this. Oh, I should not erase that. That's the axiom. We have the axiom of unrestricted comprehension. I may write this as uh, x subject to uh, 5x, right? You may condition on anything and get anything. We would replace this in a more modern terms with something called restricted comprehension, which is that you may only define sets that are subsets of other sets. So if some set already exists, you may define any subset of that set, but you may not in general have unrestricted comprehension. This on the surface convince yourself this should prevent this should prevent Russell's paradox at a first attempt, right? You can't immediately plug in the set, of the set of all sets that do not contain themselves trivially. It turns out, for more complicated reasons, restricted comprehension on the surface appears to not have uh, Russell's paradox, right? Uh, the second thing is what Russell spent uh, 20 years of his life work on, uh, his, life, his life's work on, which is called the theory of types. So he created... Fred has a system, Bezirgriff is a small manual. Um, Russell has this system called uh, Principia Mathematica. He spends 20 years writing uh, a set of axioms to derive all of mathematics from. And it's like 6,000 pages. No one's ever read it. It's pure symbolic manipulation all the way through. It's very formal. 
Um, and he tried to create a theory of types to avoid self-reference. The point of the theory of types is that the, the problem was that sets could talk about themselves. The word I or I am or this sentence was allowed to be formalized. So if you constructed a theory of types, you could avoid self-reference by allowing sort of a case system. Types could only talk about other types, but not types lower than themselves, but not themselves. So for example, you have a hierarchy like this. And a type may only discuss properties of those that are lower than it. But nothing can uh, refer to itself. And through a theory of types, hopefully he hoped to prove a system with both, with both consistent and complete, one that was provably consistent and perhaps provably complete and serve as a granite foundation for all mathematics. This is what he wanted to do. So these are two just sort of loose. I'm not going to explain why these try to prevent Russell's paradox. But on the surface, perhaps you can be convinced these prevent the naive trick that is Russell's paradox, right? Questions on those? Question? Oh, okay. All right, I'm going to show you one last thing. Let's go. Oh, hold on. Let's do that one. All right, let's see if it'll show the camera itself or the thing I have. Is that the camera? Yeah, it is. OK, I'm going to turn off the lights. can only turn them off. I'm just going to turn them all off. OK. Well, how am I going to read now? Uh, Oh, that was not very smart of me. What if we, hold on. I'm not. OK, OK. There's a graphic novel by uh, several people. I hope it's still recording. Let's see. Yes, OK. There's a graphic novel by a few Grecians. One of them, whose name you might recognize, is Christos Papadimitriou. His name is on like every mathematics textbook I've ever seen. Uh, computer science textbook, theoretical computer science. Guy's great. He wrote this. Graphic novel about the life and history of Bertrand Russell. So we're going to go through the history in the graphic novel. It's fantastic. Oh, before I do that, I have a copy of the original um, f uh, $50 bill. A student got me this. And look, you can see the configurations on the uh, Bank of England 50 pound note, You know, their little fake monopoly money. And then here's a, a fake monopoly money of the fake monopoly money. But you can see the fake one doesn't have the configurations, but the real one does have the configuration. So that's just a diagram from this table. There's a little Turing machine there. So that's pretty cool. Um, there's Papa Dimitriou. Let's go through some of the things. So it goes off. I'm just going to kind of skim through it. It goes off through his early life. He's like learning uh, Euclidean geometry. He's like talking to all these people. He meets uh, some people. He's like walking around. I don't know what these guys are doing. Hold on. Let me see if I have. So here's an example of the notation that Frege used. This is, we, today we use propositional logic. We use P implies Q. We use and, or, not. Frege was prior to this. He didn't have, that was not invented yet. So he came up with something which is basically that, almost that. And this is the notation he used. It's almost like a circuit. It's not quite there. It's, we don't use this today. It's kind of a cumbersome notation. I'll also show you one more diagram from uh, his, his work. Two interesting diagrams I have here is this sort of arcane table of symbols. So you can see we really are doing wizard chalk magic circles or something. I don't, it's totally unreadable. No one knows what's going on. Uh, science was being done here, though, um, uh, certainly. So um, let's see. He meets Fredge. He's, he's like cutting his bushes or whatever. The guy's crazy at this point. Um, let's see if I can find you the... Chapter. He meets Cantor. Cantor at this point is older and also crazy. He has a, a dream that he, he uh, Cantor wrecked the foundation. So this is really cool graphic here, right? Uh, then I'll get to you the part about Russell's paradox, though. The, the part I'm, I'm, I'm pointing here. All right. Let's see if we can. Sets, you say? I thought you were interested in numbers. In my research, I made use of the simple idea of the priest of Bolzano. I am, but the sets are the basis of numbers. Oh, what is three but the set of all sets with three elements? Threeness is a common property of three umbrellas, three horses, three hats, three cookies. Sets have most interesting properties, really, and I thought them boring. For example, a set can contain other sets or even itself. How can, a, how can it contain itself? 
The set of all sets is an idea. Therefore, it contains itself as an element. But not all sets contain themselves? No, the set of all birds is not a bird. I say that is an interesting dichotomy. The set of sets which contain themselves and the set of sets which don't. About which we can ask, well, does it contain itself? He gets his little eureka moment. In my life to date, I have written dozens of books, hundreds of articles. I've given thousands of lectures, but I suspect now if my name will survive, if it does at all, for a confounded paradox I discovered that year. A paradox that brought logic upside down. I'll give you a taste of it. Imagine a town with a strict law on shaving, but every adult male is required to shave daily. But it's not obligatory to shave yourself. Obligatory to shave yourself. For those who don't, for those who don't want to, there is a barber. In fact, the law decrees those who don't shave themselves are shaved by the barber. Those who don't shave themselves are shaved by the barber. It sounds innocuous. However, taken literally, it leads straight to paradox. For you see, the question arises, who will shave the barber? He obviously cannot choose to shave himself. For being the barber, it would mean that he is shaved by the man who shaves only those who don't shave themselves. But he cannot go to the barber, for again, that will mean he is in, he'll shave himself, for which the barber isn't for. So the barber, this is called the barber's paradox, the barber is uh, the diagonal here. Do you see the problem? And that's Papa Demetrius. There's some fourth wall stuff in this book, and that's what he looks like in real life. Do you see the problem? I'm not sure. It's very much like the paradox of the liar. Which liar? The famous pronouncement of Idubiles, the man who said, my fellow citizens, I am now lying to you. Think of it. If he's lying, then he is in, is in fact telling the truth. And if he's, he's telling the truth, he's lying. When something refers to itself, paradox is nearby. Take self-referential books, for example. Reference books? No, no. Books that include uh, uh, a reference to themselves, like Stern's Tristam Shanty, Calvino's If on a, Winter, uh, if on a Winter's Night tra a Traveler, or Kurt Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions. Of course, Logic Comics is also self-referential. I've never heard of any of those books. Suppose now you make a complete catalog of all books that are not self-referential. It will be this big catalog, yes. Sure, but the question is, will it contain itself? So she's thinking, she's thinking... And they got it. If it does, then it does not. And if it does not, it does. The student gets an A+. Plus. So what this, what's this got to do with Russell's paradox? Like these examples, it has self-reference at its core. Does the set of all sets which do not contain themselves contain itself? To which the answer is, if it doesn't, then if it does, then it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then it does. Voila, Russell's paradox. It sounds like par parlor witticism, but it subverts the notion of set as a collection defined by a common property, and with it, logic. He's saying it subverts the axiom of unrestricted comprehension. This is written for children, by the way, so I'm filling in some of the math. Um, the publication of my paradox made me an overnight celebrity in international mathematical circles. Some greeted it with joy, like Poincaré, who saw the paradox as strong arguments against any attempt to create a purely logical system, to create purely, purely logical foundations for mathematics. His often repeated credo was that logic is barren, is now found a perfect justification. So actually, it's not barren. It just breeds contradictions. Haha, ha, this Russell hit two birds with one stone. Logic and set theory are both destroyed. So that's uh, Poincaré. Um, rather surprisingly, Cantor's reaction was also quite positive. Therefore, if we take the property S belonging to S and consider its negation as defining the set, and then uh, of sets which do not, glory be to Almighty God. Uh, in a f I'm a free man at last, don't you see? The Englishman proved the set of all sets is an impossibility. My monster, the usurper of God's absolute greatness, thus no longer exists. Given the right amount of rationality, one can read even religion into logic. So this is Cantor. He did Cantor diagonalization like 40 years earlier. And at this point, he's aged and he's kind of old and crazy. Um, but in the pro-set camp, there was bewilderment and consternation. The logicians were devastated. Giuseppe Piano in Turin, non a possible, non a possible, non a possible. So there he's walking around. David Hilbert in Gottingen, there must be some way around this, her professor. Ja, ja, there must be damned upstart Brit. And of course, Gottlob Frege in Vienna. He read my paradox on the very day when he was to give the go-ahead to print volume two of his Foundations of Arithmetic. In an instant, he realized the importance of my discovery. Frege, too, has built his edifice on the simple idea, on the ground of Balz Balzano's simple idea of set. And now he had seen that the ground was rotten. It had given away. By implanting sets into logic, he injected a lethal canker into its body, so the foundations of arithmetic were unfounded. 
What? What? To destroy the printing plates? Immediately. Don't you see it's wrong? It's a disgrace. It's a grotesque sham. Her professor, we slaved for this in years on end. If you don't take pity on your own work, at least consider mine. I implore you, don't do it, sir. In the end, he did publish volume two of the Foundations of Arithmetic, but with an addendum. Of all the acts of intellectual honesty I have witnessed in my life, none compare with Gottlob Frege's reaction to my paradox. There cannot be a greater intellectual courage than this to put the truth above all else. Hardly anything more unfortunate can befall a scientific writer than to have one of the foundations of his edifice shaken after the work is finished. I was placed in this position by a letter of Mr. Bertrand Russell just when the printing of this volume was nearing its completion. The collapse of my laws to which Mr. Russell's paradox leads seems to undermine not only the foundations of my arithmetic, but the only such possible foundations of arithmetic as such. So he goes on. There's some, you know, they're hanging out. He, that's, he's working with Whitehead. So, that's, so there's Russell and Whitehead. They have an idea of, like, how can we fix this? Let's see if I can find it. Some more drama. Um, here's basically what his program is going to be. Mathematics must be based on logic. Fredge creates the right logic based on sets. I find a paradox. Logic is faulty. White and high must fix it. So Whitehead and Russell spend 20 years trying to write Principia Mathematica, and they're going to do step five, basically. They're trying to fix, create a set of axioms that don't do this. Let me see if I can find the picture I'm looking for. I think, I'm, I, think I lost it. But it had a description here of... Ah, uh, yes. So here's describing the uh, theory of types as a sort of a caste system where uh, you have a sequence of barbers. Each can shave the previous, but none can shave themselves. You know? And they spend 20 years trying to create a set of axioms that not only could do this, but uh, prove not only were free of paradox, but were provably free of par paradox. So whether or not they were successful or not, we'll have to come to next time. So we'll finish the book on uh, Thursday. Before I do that, any questions? All right.